learn about the progression of lifeguarding in the area from a former beach monkey, now beach safety director. Coming up next on Carolina People. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're with the Myrtle Beach Herald. We're focused on beach safety along the Grand Strand. And we're visiting with the Beach Safety Director for Horry County, Duke Brown. Good morning, Good Duke. Good morning. Thank you for having Great me. Great to have you in. To Appreciate see some it. Of the props you've brought in, some <laughs> of the changes in lifeguarding along the Strand. I think I saw you've been involved on the waterfront to here for right at 40 years. 40 now. years, if you consider my days as a beach monkey, which is out junior guard, and my lifeguard days and beach patrolling days, it ends up being about 40 years. It's amazing, Duke. You were out of the womb 40 years ago. I wish. I mean, <laughs> that's incredible. I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's been a good experience for me. I love being down here. And I think I saw you're, you're right at 29 years of teaching now, Ten, coming yes. up on 29 Nine years. years. Of, yes. And is that primarily physical education teaching? Well, actually, I started out in 1976 as, as a fifth grade teacher in Durham County, our home county. Is that right? Our and, home county. And That's right. then um, I was offered a position here at Sox T High School where I coached, and I was a special ed teacher and PE. Then I was offered a job on the air base at their school. and. Then I was with the federal government schools for 22 years in phys ed and in coaching. And then I was offered a position at Seaside Elementary in Garden City in 2000. And I decided it's time to get back into the county system. And I'm loving it ever since. Absolutely. Golly, that's amazing. Of course, you and I have in Durham County in common. Of course, I was yeah. at Duke yesterday. And it's what? tough to be with somebody from Durham who's named Duke and to uh, think, why wouldn't you be living in Durham with that name? Well, that's kind of a... Uh, a uh, name that's been uh, placed on me by lifeguards over the year, years. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was a, a beach monkey, a junior guard, the, the guards I was uh, assisting couldn't remember my name. I used to wear a Duke University t-shirt. No way. And they ended up uh, just saying, hey, Duke this, hey, Duke that. So it kind of stuck on me. And then in the mid-70s, I was a competitive skateboarder, and they want a flashy name. Oh, yeah. So they ended up, some of the guys knew me from my lifeguarding days and just kind of stuck on me. If I hear somebody say Duke, I know it from somebody down here with lifeguard. If I hear them say Kent, I know it's somebody from Durham. That, You're kidding. You know, that's that hilarious. Went, you know, Do you still have family with. in Durham, Duke? Yes, my brother, his family's still there, and my mother is still there. Is that right? Yes. You get them down here much. I'm sure well, they love my, having yeah, Duke my, living in In fact, there. my mother comes down here um, probably for six months out of the year. Is that you know, right? She enjoys the beach also. I'm sure she does. There was something about Myrtle. Now, you started coming down here in 1965. Though. We did. We started actually camping. 1965 Lakewood Campground. That's where I started my uh, days uh, assisting lifeguards. Right. And we did that from 65 through 70. In the early 70s, my parents ended up um, getting a, a site in Ocean Lakes, and we ended up getting a permanent site. So I started coming down here, you know, uh, for the whole summer and, right. and started gardening. I actually guarded throughout the 70s. I um, did a few other things too, but I always guarded whether it was full time or, or part time. I was sure. always garden. I think I saw later you were the uh, the pool manager there at Ocean Lake. Yes, for three years in 79, 80, and 81. <laughs> I had to go back and think that one out. Is that right? Yeah. Now, you mentioned a professional skateboarder. Having seen all that bio info on you, I didn't. I never saw a professional skateboarder. Yeah, well, what was that like? Well, you know, actually, I started skateboarding when I was in college uh, to keep up with my surfing. I loved to surf and swim. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the guys down here gave me a skateboard to carry back to college uh, when I was going to the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, so right. I would practice that and uh, ended up being sponsored and did some TV um, activity uh -huh. on, on when they were when the skateboarders come back real big with polyurethane wheels and so on. And Bain Skateboards ended up um, picking me up for their team, East Coast Bain, and it just kind of went from there. Also, I was the manager of the Myrtle Beach Skateboard Park for um, two two years. Is that right? That was right in front of the airbase. 
and so it's uh, but I also guarded during those times too. Yeah, you know, I sure. just couldn't get away from the beach. What was that like? Do you pick up a skateboard at all anymore, dude? No, I I'll be fifty two in two weeks. So, <laughs> it, you know, I, I don't I do I still surf a lot, but you know, right. when you fall it's a lot easier to fall in water in than the on water, the concrete. Than on the but, concrete I'm but sure. it's uh, I guess I'm termed as a um or old time skateboarder or um old age skateboard. They got a yeah. term for us that used to skateboard back in the seventies. Uh, I was two time North Carolina State men's champion. Is that right? And so that was when, do you communicate much with some of the guys you were competing about against back then or well, I still I still see some of those guys yeah. from time to time. You know, sure. it's kinda of funny. See, especially Actually, I'm teaching some of their kids now. I <laughs> some bet. Of I was about to say yeah, down I'm, here. I'm sure. teaching second generations. And, of course, I've had a bunch of those from Red Cross lifeguarding courses, too, because oh, a yeah. bunch of the skateboards were surfers, and they were, you know, staying around the water, too, so they were getting involved in lifeguarding. You know. And that's still the case, Duke. A lot yeah. of the guys who are surfing do skateboarding as well. I mean, they really want to stay agile yeah, all do. year long. They do. And you, a lot of activities. There's so much out there for um, students now to, to do that and, it's, and keep up with and you know fit, stay physically fit it's, it's important and, mm -hmm. and we can encourage that I love to swim that keeps me fit and we encourage our junior guards at Seaside to, to swim and, and you know do a lot of war activities. How often do you get in a pool or in the ocean to swim Duke? Are you in virtually about every day? About every day right. every other day I, um, on my days off I'm looking for waves to surf and I swim in, in the ocean if, uh, you know, if we don't have any surf, I'll end up getting out swimming five, six hundred yards. Right. So so swimming for you is normally in the ocean? Yeah. Yes, except during the winter I'll be in pools, especially right. when we deal with our junior guards. Any Red Cross programs we're doing, I'll, I'll actually be in the pools during those times. It gets a little cold. My body doesn't handle cold water like it used to, and even with the wetsuit on it. So, <laughs> used to, you could put it on and off real quick, but now, you know, it's not so hard putting it on, but taking it off takes you a little time. Yeah. Duke, you probably still see folks out on the beach that are anxious to get in the water because they can't see everything below them, and they get a little fearful of things. Do y'all, do you ever talk to any of the folks? Or do yeah, you people will stop you from time to time. We always encourage um, everyone that you know, come to the beach to make sure they go and uh, speak with the lifeguard, find out if there are any hazards or swim near a lifeguard because they're going to be familiar with that environment. Right, right. The lifeguards are real familiar with anything, anything. that could potentially be out there. Because they're, they're, they're there day in, day out, so they know what what's happening in, within that area. Right, right. I thought it was just uh, the lifeguards. Uh, you, you just never know, obviously, and they're really in tune. How far off and, I mean, how far apart are the lifeguards normally spread out? Depending in the city of Myrtle Beach, they're usually about a block apart. In the county in which I deal with those guards, they may be a block apart, they may be two or three blocks apart, depending on which area. And, and of course, the guards are going to be placed in areas where they're, it's most dense. Okay, right, and, sure. And then our, our county beach patrol also will patrol down in the areas that don't have guards, uh, always, you know, watch for any potential problems. You know, before in, in lifeguarding, you would always worry about reacting you know once a problem occurred now there's so much emphasis placed on prevention that right. you know you're trying to alleviate any problems before they happen oh yeah sure it's amazing to think about that 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 aspect of really having to be on top of everything and of course that's really impacted the focus on lifeguarding it has. over the years as well as some of the changes in lifeguarding fortunately you bought some brought some great yeah. props out here when you look at lifeguarding especially going back in the 60s and 70s when you had uh, early 70s when you had senior life saving it was mostly dealing with how do you react to a certain situation right. they also brought in boat safety and, and some other uh, using your body uh, as flotational or using objects you know like clothes on as flotational devices now the emphasis is placed on equipment based rescues it's also placed on uh, surveillance uh, making sure your patrons know what's going on out there. Also, lifeguarding has specialized now. It, before, when you learned lifeguarding, you learned, uh, obviously, how, how to make rescues. Mm -hmm. You didn't really worry about a lot of uh, equipment usage. You, right. When you went and took a lifeguarding course, you learned direct contact. Mm -hmm. With your body. And, and now everything, especially around pools and water parks, is totally equipment-based. And many of the guards that end up coming to our beaches now 
are familiar with Ellis or Red Cross, of course, our beach contracts uh, require our uh, lifeguards to be certified in Red Cross or equivalent uh, life saving, which gives them the basis because when you have so many seasonal um, people coming down for jobs and from everywhere else, you don't know, you just don't want to hand them a job and say, here, you're going to be a lifeguard. You, you need to have some type of baseline. Right. And right. when our beach services hire uh, individuals to come in, uh, to be guards, at least they know they're at a certain proficiency. They, then they take them, and we, um, it's in the county, we have a rookie school, and we take them in the ocean and make them aware of some rescue techniques that they have not been aware of or have not been taught. And the beach services also have um, uh, instructors within their services or training officers that actually bring the guards um, through a certain amount of um, will provide knowledge and certain amount of uh, practical aspects to, to lifeguarding on the surf since they have probably learned information in a, from a pool. In a pool, a sure. Because again, if it's lifeguarding site specific now, and, and if they come from pool, they need to have a certain amount of knowledge and certain abilities to be able to react in the ocean. And you can't just hope they will know that you have to make sure they know it before they come in. They have to meet certain swimming requirements. The Red Cross doesn't require you to meet uh, a certain time limit when you do the 500, but when you come here, the county requires you to um, um, swim 500 uh, meters in 12 minutes, but the United States Life Saving Association requires you to swim in 10 minutes or less. 10 and minutes or less, less versus less. 5 minutes. Well, 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 well versus that no, 12, 12, 12 minutes, minutes yeah. me, 12, 12 minutes, minutes right. yeah. The, um, so it, it's a stiffer uh, requirement. Right. Of course, if you are USLA certified, uh, you have to you know, meet that time frame. We have one uh, lifeguard agency down here that is um, certified, that, and they require their lifeguards to make the 10 minutes one that's lax speed service. Lax speed yeah, service, that's yeah. pretty sizable uh, territory he's covered. Yeah, he has quite a, he has, of course, the South County, he has a certain uh, set of guards in the city, then he has them in the North County. Right. But I think all beach services require the guys to go through a lot of training. Sure, they, of course. These, you know, one thing that makes our, our system unique compared to any other beach anywhere else is that our beach service owners were former lifeguards mm -hmm. that became businessmen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they understood what it takes to be a lifeguard on our beach and as well as, you know, handle the business in. Sure. And uh, that's the reason our system works as well as it does. Mm -hmm. And also we have ordinances that control the, the length that you're able to, you know, go out into the ocean chest deep at 50 yards. And we have ordinances that, um, that help keep problems at minimum. That's great. Duke, we've got some amazing props here. I yeah. want to make sure we get get into those. We're about halfway through the interview, okay. and there's a lot to focus on. It's amazing. Share with viewers real quick from the uh, the three pieces that are out in front okay. of them. <laughs> the first one is, is the old torpedo buoy. It's, of course, a metal-type frame. And You're I, on my right. Yeah, yeah. If you had to really watch out and make sure when you were going through the surf that you didn't knock yourself out <laughs> or knock your victim out because those things are heavy. Oh, yeah. And, and two, a lot of times you would actually throw it out to someone to grab it if they were in a certain distance. Those are heavier. In fact, the first rescue I went on carrying one of those rescue cans, I actually tripped over the rope. No way. Yes, I, you did. Yeah. I fell face down. That was right. Embarrassing. The next one is a Peterson tube. It, um, and all these have their advantages and disadvantages. Mm -hmm. The Peterson tube was designed by Pete Peterson, who was a, a former professional surfer and lifeguard in Southern California. And that is good if you have an unconscious um, victim. You can actually wrap them around, snap it, pull them okay. in. It's a good one person rescue device. The next one is a uh, Burnside buoy. It's designed by Bob Burnside over 30 years ago, and um, you can put several people on that. It's it's a molded type of. Um, mm -hmm. uh, op, that's the one here. You know, the, the last one, one down here. Yeah. And that is uh, that's recognized today. Yeah, that's recognized today. In fact, our guards along the Grand Strand used the uh, Burnside buoy. You can put two or three people on it, but the only problem is you really have to control an unconscious person on it with a what we call a do -si do type of maneuver, the front surface approach into a do -si do where the piece from TV can wrap it around and, and control them a lot better. But the Burnside buoys are 
more of what we see here because the majority of the people that we rescue down here, you know, 98 percent of them, 99 percent of them will be conscious and you can put two or three people on there. As well as our guards have also learned how to do direct contact rescues, mm -hmm. which is something we cover in our surf schools. And of course the surf school, you, you've been real active as a volunteer, very active at the American Red Cross, and right. so you're both giving instruction on life saving, CPR, other aspects that are critical in the summertime and all year round. How did you get involved in that, Duke? In 1982, when I with, went with the City Beach Patrol, I became a water safety instructor and a uh, CPR first aid instructor. Right. In, in the past, our lifeguard course is just taught lifeguarding. You had to get CPR and first aid elsewhere. Now with the way the course is designed, everything's built in in the mm -hmm. one, making the lifeguard look like a professional rescuer, right. being being like a police or a fireman. They they come in and learn these skills and they combine it. It's so much more to lifeguard than it used to be. But when I went through the instructor courses, the, the beach patrol actually did all the training. They didn't have training officers for the beach services. And um once uh, we would go in and, and train them CPR and first aid in the course at the beginning of summer and we would um, and then any of the new lifeguards would come in that were not certified we would assist the beach services and train those individuals to become certified right. you know using the Red Cross cor courses sure. in the past in, in the early 80s and in mid 70s advanced life saving was the course that everybody went through. Right. Or either the Y, but Advanced Life Saving was the main course. It, it, it was good, a solid course. As long as you were a water safety instructor, you could teach swim lessons as well as the, the junior lifeguard and Advanced Life Saving. Mm -hmm. In the mid 80s, the Red Cross started kind of splitting that. The WSIs were going to be handling swim lessons. Now we were looking at lifeguard instructors to handle lifeguarding, and they went through that that aspect. Wow. So the WSIs and lifeguard instructors are separate entities now. The, our local chapter, and we, of course we had just merged with Georgetown, the um, coastal South Carolina chapter, right. um, includes about 150 instructors in, in the water areas. Is that right? 150 certified certifications dealing with it, because some of sure. the WSIs and lifeguard instructors are, are, you know, are doing both. So. Right, sure. But um, and as they went, once they went to the lifeguard aspect, it got a little tougher. Then they changed up because they got site specific. They started being more concerned about pools and water parts. And right. the, in fact, the Red Cross indicated that they looked at the USLA as being the authority in surf lifeguard mm -hmm. in, in the 90s. So they got tended to get away from that. Everything was equipment based for pools, water parks, in non-surf uh, open water, which would be lakes. Sure, and if you like go to that. water parks now, you'll oftentimes see those folks yep. carrying the uh, the buoy. Yeah. At the, end. the techniques are done differently in water parks than, of course, they are sure, in, than in, on the in ocean. ocean yeah. yeah, and that's why they have a, a certain certification. The Red Cross has a water park certification. They have a a waterfront certification, which is for lakes as well as the lifeguard certification. But you have to go through the lifeguard certification to be able to. Um, take the waterfront or water park modules. Good, good. So. You know, it's so critical when you think about uh, earlier this morning before we started filming, you talked about rip currents. Yes. And some of the aspects there in your many years, and of course I think I mentioned to you, maybe we saw Darius Fowler who right. you work with out on the beach was uh, highlighted in the Herald last week, the public safety aspect, but there's so many components on rip currents. He talked about in 2002 helping save somebody's life out right. there. These are one of the critical rip currents, one of the things that oftentimes catch a lot of folks off guard, particularly coming in from outside of the area. What's a way that a viewer to the a viewer or a visitor to the area could uh, could be careful out when rip currents are present? Well, one thing about rip currents are usually seen when we have several days of onshore wind, mm -hmm. when the water seems to be piling up, especially if we have extra tropical systems off our coast or even something like a hurricane off Puerto Rico will send swells toward us so we have a lot of water being piled up on the beach and a normal amount of that water will recede out but a lot of it cannot recede be, uh, straight out because you have incoming water so it goes down down the beach and right. it looks for a, a point uh, a quick release uh, uh, least resistance so right. it goes through that little channel into what we call the head of the rip but where the the rips are the most dangerous are in the channels where people 
are trying to fight to get back in. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rip may be flowing six, seven, eight miles an hour. Even a good swimmer can't swim any more than two miles an hour, so you're not going to fight the Rip. So your best bet is to actually let Rip take you out into the head where it ends up being um, not as swift and you can actually swim out, swim parallel to the, uh, so to the you, beach. So if you're being pulled out, let it take you? Let it take you out. And some of the research now indicates that uh, rips may be, end up sh actually pushing you out somewhere along the neck. Before we thought everybody would actually go to the head, but now it's like the little eddies <laughs> shooting you out of the, out of the rip. And, um, they're seeing some evidence of that now. And usually rips are most noticeable two hours before low tide two hour, or two hours after when we've had extra water being built up. So your lifeguards are constantly thinking yeah. about this, too. I they mean, are. They're, they're as, as, as recognizing as, as so. they can be, absolutely. I mean, obviously you can't cover everything out no. there. It's the ocean. But. Well, that's why we recommend for individuals come to the beach, swimming from the lifeguard, because they're going to recognize it's really tough unless you have a calm day it's hard to recognize rip current, so they're going to see the conditions stable for that. If it's real chaotic in the surf line, it's going to be hard to recognize rip till you get caught in it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you, you got got problems. That's why again, it emphasis the swim near life. Swim guard. near a lifeguard. Those yes. are great words. Gene Hudson's been pumping that up <laughs> every summer. It seems like yeah. I talk to him, bump into him in the post office. He's saying, "Greg, swim near a lifeguard," lifeguard yes. and he's serious about it that because they're going to be familiar with it. And our guards learn about the rips, they learn about longshore currents, they learn about inshore holes. Right. And it, there's so many aspects you have to look at when you're dealing with the beach environment. It's right. not a pool, it's not a closed water area sure. where you know where the depth is all the time. You know, oh, yeah. you can see the bottom, it's just not something that's there. So you need to rely on someone who knows the information. That's critical, Duke. Speaking of that, what are some other potential hazards? We just got a couple of minutes. What are some of the potential hazards that folks should be thinking about out of the beach, or I mean, what what are some of the critical things that you lifeguards would be pointing out? Be aware of the weather conditions. Mm -hmm. If it's lightning, thundering, you need to make sure you're clearing off the beach because lightning's going to hit the high spot. You know, mm -hmm. anywhere if you're on the beach, you're going to you may be the high spot or in the water, and you don't want to become a victim of that. Also, be aware of when the fish are running. You don't want to stand in the school of fish because anything that's moving like that like a school there'll be something following it like a shark or anything with te teeth out there you definitely don't want to be in a, a, a meal for, or a, you know for a fish because if a shark's looking for fish to eat and you're there he might you know he won't end up taking out like jaws but he may take a bite off it's gonna hurt so yeah. um, you, know, you don't want to you don't want to be there if you can take yourself out of dangerous situations do that that's critical so if we feel fish i mean a school of fish coming by move move yeah because you, you can figure something's going to be feeding on it and the lifeguards are always watching that right right mm -hmm. so the lifeguards you, you need to be aware of that as well as don't hang around piers because they're barnacles and a lot of fish hang around the piers too you know you know, they're just not sharks out there. There's a lot of other fish that can do some damage if it wanted sure. to, or turtles, anything like that. That's good to know. I hadn't thought about that. You know, folks, talk, obviously promoting good water yeah. safety practices are so critical. It is. And, you know, and, and, and of course, some other great things here. You brought some props with you there, yes. Duke. Some, some of the old lifeguard, our double knit lifeguard and shorts that uh, <laughs> we used to. Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah, I tell you, first time I hit the water in a pair of the pair of those I ended up uh, feel like you were coming down, my, yeah, knee, came down sure. to my knees that's why I wear a pair of lifeguard trunks under my beach patrol outfit so that right? this is that. old Vernon's lifeguard shirt from the late 60s oh yeah and this is the old London Fog <laughs> lifeguard jacket from the, from the jacket 60. you had to uh, yeah. wear you can yeah, wear over here. that's off. good it's been wild over the years with that <laughs> that's amazing you know when you think about all the different aspects and it's critical these folks are told and made yes. very clear, you have to wear a lifeguard uniform. This they is do, a yes. serious job. You know what guards are. They're going to have the rescue cans with them. And pool guards and everybody, that, you know where the guards are. They have uniforms on. They have the equipment with them. Mm -hmm. so, it, is, it is critical. This is a real job. Folks are to be taken seriously. And these are the people to talk to. Definitely. You go to them clearly. They've been trained. It's just so many. Um, things that they're learning now and, and between the radios before when we lifeguard back in the early 70s you didn't have radios you you had a quarter in your tackle box and you mm -hmm. sent somebody up to call for a, a rescue unit if you had problems 
because you either you and your partner were by yourselves uh, until someone got there. Uh, now with the radio, you have automatic beach patrol to you have supervisors from the lifeguard service. When the lifeguard has a problem, we're right there on top of it. Those are great words. What are the most critical things, Duke? If you just had a minute to share with viewers the most critical things to think about when you're coming out to the beach, what would those be? First off, know the environment, know where you are, especially if you have small kids, because we have probably our greatest problem on the beach is lost children. Just make sure your child knows where you are and, and you know where your child is mm -hmm. make, and tell them where they are and where the lifeguard is. Make sure they go to the lifeguard if they get lost and always watch them because you got a lot of people down. The lifeguards are scanning and watching for potential problems but there's so many out there. A parent can be a lifeguard by watching the cheer, uh, child and preventing a problem from occurring. Those are great words, Duke. Thank thanks you. so much for being with us this Thank morning. Absolutely. It. Stay tuned to more Carolina Pete with Duke Brown coming up next. You know, sitting here with Duke for 30 minutes, you could talk about teaching for 29 years. You could also talk about a heck of a lot more. So many folks come to the beach for what reason? to get out on the beach. A lot come here to shop, they come here to eat, they come here to do a lot of things, but they come here partly because that name is Myrtle Beach. There's a big beach out here along the Grand Strand and there are a lot of different beaches. Horry County has a lot, Georgetown has a lot, Brunswick. Multiple reasons for folks to come, but that simple message that Duke gets across, swim near a lifeguard. Swim near a lifeguard and ask them questions. They want you to ask them questions. They want you to ask them about rip currents and about how to protect yourself if you're getting too hot, about drinking more water, simple questions. A lot of things you may not even think to ask somebody about. Take the time, swim near a lifeguard. You know, we could have talked to Duke about winning Beach Patrol of the Year for Horry County last year, or Policeman of the Month from Horry County Police back in the late 90s. You know, there's so many other aspects of his life you could talk about. Growing up inland, you wonder why folks end up on the beach. When you start at age 12, 40 years ago, and continue to the present, it's easy to see why folks are attracted, saving lives. And that's a mission of the Red Cross. That's a mission of so many, and that's a mission of all the lifeguards you'll come in contact with.